day to follow along today as we look at mind games, how to develop a, a healthy self-image part two. So this is uh, kind of tagged on from last week. If you missed last week, uh, I don't know if there's any CDs on the way out. You can grab some. If not, you can always listen online if, uh, if, you, if you need to, and we'll get caught up in today's lesson. So let's talk a little bit about what we looked at last week and then jump in today, okay? So I started with a story last week about elephants. I told you I came across an article. Uh, the headline was uh, Releasing the Elephant in You. And it just kind of caught me, right? It was like, what in the world is that? And so I started reading through, and this, this particular person talked about how they train elephants and how it kind of is a picture of our, in our own life. And so in the circuses, and I'm not saying I'm for it or against it, so don't, don't get upset with me, uh, but how circuses train elephants is when the elephants are just little guys or little girls, um, they take them and they take a, a stake and a chain and they drive it into the ground and they concrete it actually in the ground, the stake in the ground. They put a heavy chain on it and they shackle the front leg of the elephant. And so you could imagine if you're, you know, if you take a three-year-old and you try to hold a three-year-old down, right? They're active, they're wanting to move around and all this stuff. And so the elephant's the same way. It wants to go out and play, run around and whatever else. And it learns at a young age that it can't break the chain. That there's the stake in the ground, the chain is thick and heavy, and that as a little guy, a little girl, can't break it. But also learns something else that the shackle, as it tries to move around, creates uh, uh, sores and it becomes very tender on the, on the elephant's leg. And then you fast forward into the elephant's life and you wonder when you go to a circus how they can have a little chain and a little dowel in the ground and this great big mammoth, you know, 15,000 pound animal who has the ability to break 12,000 pounds of, of strength, has the ability to, to pull and lift 12,000 pounds of strength, how that little chain and that little uh, stick in the ground keeps the elephant there. And the reason why is because it's trained and its perspective is it can't move. And when it tries to get a little bit anxious and begins to move around, it's also reminded of the tenderness of the sore that was caused by the shackle. And so it lives as if it cannot break it. The elephant could, and every once in a while you'll hear, hear stories about where the elephant's running through the, through, the, through the community, it could and easily break free, but the elephant's perspective from a little young age is that it can't, and therefore it stays. It lives as if it's the truth. Now it's one thing for an elephant, it's another thing for us. And we sit here, and most of us are probably adults, and we sit here and we have similar experiences in our life, and the Bible calls them strongholds. We looked at that in week one and week two. And that's where we believe things as if it were true, even though it may not be true. And we live our life around and we make decisions around these strongholds that we have in our life as if it were true. And, and so maybe as a young person, you grew up and, you know, no, 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 not putting blame on anybody, but you were told you were stupid or you were dumb or you would never achieve anything in life. And it had become, and it has become a stronghold in your life. And you believe that. And as a result, you're 20, 30, 40 years later, you make decisions around that idea that you're stupid, that you'll never accomplish anything, that you won't make it. And you make your decisions around those strongholds. That is your perspective. You, you ever have other people who, who will look at life and, and they were told, hey, you could never have a healthy relationship. And they get into a healthy relationship and they explode it. And everyone around them goes like, why did you do that? That person was a great catch or that lady was a great catch for you. But they explode it. Because they're taught in a stronghold way that they could never have a healthy relationship. And it's healthy. So they got to explode it. They got to blow it up. And those types of things happen way more often in our lives than what we want to believe. We are much like the elephant. We got a stake in the ground, pound in the ground. We got a chain shackle to our leg and we're stuck there. And that is our perspective. That is what we believe. We live as if it were true and we're, we're, we stay there. So <clears throat> in your outline, the last couple weeks, and I want to just kind of recap from last week, and we're going to jump into today's talk. Last, uh, last week, we talked about strongholds. 
And then strongholds is to fortify. It means to fortify through the idea or holding safely a castle. And so it becomes something in our mind that we believe it's true, even though it may not be true at all. It becomes a stronghold in our life. And we said this, that oftentimes the enemy will use that stronghold in our life to prevent us from being all that Christ wants us to be. We believe something that isn't true or consistent with the word of God and we live our life as if it were true in our life. And so we said this, that in order to break it, you can't break it with earthly weapons or fleshly weapons. The world, world uh, in, in there, the world means earth or fleshly. You can't break it with fleshly weapons. So if you are sitting here today and someone told you you would never amount to anything, you're, you're never going to achieve, right? It doesn't matter how much education you get, and I'm all for education, nothing wrong with that. You will not be able to educate yourself above that stronghold in your life. You need something greater than that. And you need something that is godly, something that is divine in your life in order to smash it and you need to understand what God says to you and about you in his word in order to break that in your life. And so in John chapter 8, verse 31, <clears throat> Jesus says this to the Jews who believe. Jesus said, if you hold, and that you can circle the word hold. We looked at this several times. But that word means hold or stay or it means to wash over, which I think is a great picture. So Jesus says, if you hold, if you stay, if you allow uh, uh, my truth to wash over you, he goes on and he says, you are really my disciples. And then verse 32, and there's a key word that's connected to hold, and that is the word then. Then you will know the truth, and what will the truth do? The truth will set you free, right? But it's not until you stay, you hold, you remain, you allow his, what he has to say to you. Not what someone else says to you or about you, but what Christ says to you and about you. When you allow his truth to wash over you and you grab a hold of it, then you will know the truth and that truth has the potential or will set you free from driving the stake in the ground and living as if that were true. Are we following okay? Yeah. <clears throat> so Paul recognizes this. And actually if you do a study on mind or thoughts, Paul has a lot to say about his concern about not the unbelieving world, but the believing world, the church, and having the enemy actually hijack our mind and take us away. And, and you can do your own study on that if you, if you wish to. So Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ by the will of God to, all, uh, to the saints in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Verse 2. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. Praise be to God the Father uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms, and we'll get into that in a minute, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. <clears throat> in love, verse 5, he predestined us to be adopted as, uh, as his sons through Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, verse 6, to the praise and his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. Okay? And so we said big idea last week, number one is we said this, that we need to recognize our righteousness in Christ, okay? So let me ask you, if you weren't here last week, how many saints, not saints fans, how many saints do I have in the house today? Come on, come on, hold them up. This is gonna be, this is gonna be, all right. We'll keep going. Well, you guys are playing along good, all right? All right, <clears throat> now let me ask you this. How many of you need patience in your life? Go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, all right. How many of you need love, not the love people like me, because that's way too easy, <laughs> but love unlovable people? Go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. Okay. How many of you at times in your life would say, you know what, I need faith and I need a little extra dose of faith in my life? How many would you? 
okay? And from a secular standpoint, how many, how many of you would say, you know what, I need a little bit of like drive, a little stick to itness, a little get up and go. I need to get a little amped up, a little energy drink in my life. How many would you say that? <laughs> All right. Now, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're either in a coma or in another realm, and I'm not sure which it is, all right? We'll, we'll flesh that out, all right? <clears throat> now let's look at big truth, big idea number two, okay? You need to recognize that you have, what's the word? All, all the resources in Christ. You have all the resources in Christ. Verse three, praise uh, be to, God, uh, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with Every. spiritual blessing in Christ. Okay, now don't raise your hand yet, but I want you just to think about that. Okay? Are you, are you the elephant that staked to the ground that you have strongholds in your life of beliefs Potentially that aren't even true? That are contrary to what God has to say to you and about you? And you believe that you need more patience? That you need more love? That you need more faith? That you need more drive in your life? Here's the rub. Who's right? God or you? See, here's the struggle. You know what we do? We revert right back to the chain in the ground, don't we? We do. Our thoughts just go right back there. And we think we're chained to the ground. That we need faith, love, right? We, that we need all that. <clears throat> so Paul writes this. Again, as he speaks to the church, we looked at this in week one and week two. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse five. He says, we demolish arguments... And every, uh, and that, that word means claim. It's not a word we use all the time, so it's always a little bit confusing. So we demolish, right? We demolish arguments and every claim that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we'll stop right there. Because lots of times I'll hear people say, well, that means the gospel that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on the cross, that he rose again. Well, the problem with that is that verse is much larger than that. It isn't just the gospel, it, it is included in there, but it really means all the truth about God, okay? So he says that we are to demolish arguments or claims, every claim that sets itself up against the knowledge or the truth of God, what God says to you, what God says about you through his word. I need more faith. Well, we are just told by Paul that we have everything that we need. I need more love. Well, we are just told we have everything that we need. Right? We are to take those claims and, and, and those arguments and we are to hold them captive. And we, we did this in, in actually in the message of how that actually works. That we hold that thought that I need and that I, I'm not worthy and all those things. And we hold it captive in our mind until it becomes obedient to Christ. And what that means is that you take off the stronghold that you believe, the thing that isn't true, and you remove it and you replace it with the truth of who you are in Christ. Okay? And you hold that in your mind until you take out the old and put on the new. Right? Remove the, the, the thought that's a stronghold that's preventing you from being all that God wants you to be. And you put on the truth that is in and what God says to us and about us in our life. Are we following? Yes. But see, here's the struggle, and this is exactly what Paul understood. Paul understood that we are much like the elephant, that we get trained and conditioned to believe, and we revert right back to it, and Pastor Dan says, hey, all the, all the blessings are from heaven are given to you and we'll walk out the door and tomorrow you know what we'll do? We'll, we'll drive the stake in the ground and we'll live as if we're stuck to the ground again. And that's the struggle that we have. Every once in a while you get a gift. Someone gives you a gift and then they give it. My mom was great for this. She'd give me a gift in a box and then there would be like a gift card or a check underneath it. 
and she would say, she would say to me, of course it was probably written to Tammy, but anyway, uh, she would say, now when you open up the box, you get the shirt, right, or whatever the gift is, but remember, don't throw out the box. Look in the bottom of the box, right? You ever get one of those things? Right? So you get the shirt, you look under, and there's a gift card or check or whatever, the cash, whatever the case may be. See, he, he, here's, here's my concern for us. See, we got the John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes him shall not, be per shall not perish but have eternal life. We got that thing down. But we've never gone below the t-shirt to find the truth in a deeper way. What God says to us and about us through his word. And some of us have tossed the book, right? But we got, we got the John 3.16 down. And we need to look deeper into his word to find out who we are in Christ. Our position, our place in Christ, and what is ours. And this is why so often when we say, how many saints do I have in the house? 30, you raise your hand. You don't even recognize that either God is right as he speaks through Paul and he calls you a saint or God is wrong. Which is it? See, we know the church answer. Church answer is God's right. But do we really believe it in our life? Do we really believe it? See, we'll still wrestle with that. and You can look at that from last week in our life where, where, we, want, you know, where we want to push back. So let me ask you a question. How many of you need patience in your life? Let's go back to point one. <laughs> isn't it interesting how we do that? And I'm not, you know, I appreciate your honesty and that's good. But isn't it interesting how, how our brain is conditioned to instantly raise our hand and say that we need it? Paul just said you have everything that you need. How many of you need it? If you raised your hand, in all honesty, if you raised your hand, it means you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because in Christ, we have that. Right? So when we say love, you know, it's like, okay, I'm sitting on my hand right now. I'm not, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> Next time that guy raises, raise your hand, I'm not raising for anything. Right? I'm sitting on him. Right? But, but isn't it interesting how quick we come back to it's just like our brain is just like hits a reset button and it goes, just goes right back to it. See, and the scary thing is you have strongholds in your life that you don't even recognize. And yet, you are making decisions with those strongholds in mind and you don't even know what you're thinking about. And, th and that's a scary thing to, to try to begin to ponder in, in your life and try to get your mind around it. Number two, when you understand what God says, <clears throat> then you will understand the truth, and what will the truth do? Set you free. When you understand what God says to you and about you, then you will know the truth, and that truth will set you free. Look at first, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. <clears throat> His divine power has given us, what's the word? Everything. What's the word? Everything. Everything that we need. For what? For and Okay, so what's the promise to us if we're a believer in Jesus Christ? What's the promise? The promise is that we have everything that we need. For what? For life and, right, raising the bar, for godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own uh, glory and goodness. So we have everything that we need, right? And so Peter just kind of echoes what Paul says. That we have everything we need. And, and then again, I mean, we just kind of defer back and def deflect back. And, you know, how many need patience? You'd raise your hand again. You have everything. And here's what Paul is doing. He's saying when you grab a hold of the doctrine of who you are in Christ, then it will translate into your practical living as you live in the world. But if you do not grab a hold of the doctrine, and by the way, this whole series has been on that, if you don't grab a hold of the doctrine of who you are in Christ, then you're not going to live that way. Right? And so, so he wants us to understand that. Now, in Romans chapter 8, 
verse 9, <clears throat> here's what he says to those of us who are believers. He says, you who, uh, uh, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by what? The Spirit, right? And if the Spirit of God lives in you, right? If you are a believer, if you recognize that you are a sinner, that you've missed the mark, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that He died on the cross, that He rose again, and you've confessed Him as your Lord and Savior, and He's the Lord of your life, He says the Spirit of God dwells within you. Therefore, everything that is in Christ is given to you. That's why we're righteous. We're not righteous in our own action. Anybody agree with that? Right? You, you don't have all the resources in the heavenly realms in your own, but in Christ you do. Right? In Christ you do. And then, and then he goes on and he says, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the scripture says the spirit of God dwells within you. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, then the spirit of God does not dwell in you. It's that simple. He's either in or he's not. You're either a follower of Christ or you aren't. There's no halfway. It's like, I'm almost pregnant. Doesn't work. <laughs> right? So you're either a follower of Christ or you're not a follower of Christ. If you're a follower of Christ, the Spirit of God dwells within us and therefore the, the, the everything in Christ, because we are in Christ, is given to us. Number three. If the fullness of God is in Christ and He is in you, what more do you need? Nothing. Good answer. <laughs> so let me ask you, how many of you need patience in your life? <laughs> Good. <laughs> how many how many you want me to preach for three hours? <laughs> so God has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms placed in Christ Jesus. When you understand that, you will begin to have a healthy self-image because it's not about you, but it's about Jesus to understand who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So as believers, if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. How many saints do I have in the house today? So some of the, some of the other ones... You can stick with me and we'll tell you how, how to enter into personal relationship with Christ. Second, how many of you have everything that you need for godliness and life in Christ? All right, we're getting, you, we're getting there. We're getting there. Number three, key truth. <clears throat> Big idea, here we go. You need to recognize that you are accepted in Christ, okay? You are accepted in Christ in verse six to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Who's the one he loves? Who's the one he loves? Christ, okay? So he has given us, right? <clears throat> through, uh, we, we, we are acceptable to God because we're not holy. Would you agree with that? Right? We got sinners in the house today, right? But we, but we are righteous through Christ. We have all the resources in heaven through Christ, right? We are acceptable to a holy God through Christ. In, a, in kind of a visual way, I'm a visual learner. When God looks at me, he does not look at my unrighteousness. He looks at the righteousness of Christ. He is my shield, if you will. He, when, when, if, you know, if God were to look down from heaven, he would see Christ in me. The righteousness of Christ has been imputed into my life. Not because I'm a good person, not because I'm a good guy, but because Christ is the substitute for, right, in my life. You get that? We tracking? He was nailed on a cross for my screw-ups, right? He was nailed, if you're a believer, if, uh, uh, on the cross for your screw-ups as well. Number one. So now, <clears throat> what is your relationship? Your relationship is one of acceptance, not merely that you have accepted God, but that he has made you acceptable through the one he loves. Okay? We tracking? It's a, it's a, big, it's a big thought to wrap your mind around. You, you, are, you are not accepted because of what you've done. You are accepted because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. Do you understand that? 
We, we get in that, right? Through the one he loves. When, when, when Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan, um, in Matthew chapter 3, uh, here's, what, here's what God the Father said of Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, whom uh, uh, with him I am well pleased. We are well pleased in God's sight because of what Christ has done for us. Because we are in Christ. Because we are followers of Jesus, we are in Christ and therefore we are accepted by him. Now you say, what's the big deal? The big deal is, the vast majority of believers wrestle with a feeling of being rejected. We want to fit in. We want someone to accept us. If you've ever wondered why <clears throat> kids will leave a warm house, a nice family, three meals, a soft bed, whatever, while they'll leave that and they'll go and they'll follow a bunch of, you know, lunatics doing some crazy stuff, illegal stuff, you sit back, and if it's not your kid, you sit back and you go, that just doesn't make any sense. Why would they do that? You want to know why they do that? Because they want to get accepted. And that group will accept them. Because in us, in us, because we have an old nature, in us, embedded in us, is a feeling of rejection. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what did God do? Hit the highway. You're out of here. Part of our sinful nature is, embedded in us, is a sense of feeling rejected. Right? Teenage girls, if you have teenage girls, dad, write this down. They want to get accepted. And they will look for male attention to accept them. And, note to self, a teenage boy will tell a teenage girl anything she wants to hear to be accepted. Right? Now, we talk about that in youth. You're like, Pastor Dan, you're no longer a youth pastor. I know, but you know what? Adults do the same thing, don't we? We want to get accepted, right? Sure, right? You know, you call it midlife crisis. It's, it's bogus. You know what it is? They want to get accepted. So they go out and, guys, you buy something, you pull up next to somebody, rum, rum, rum. So I go, oh, I like that, right? Ladies, you go to, you know, wherever the fancy store is and you buy two or whatever it is because one's not enough and <laughs> why not buy two, right? And if they're on sale, you buy three and look at all the money we saved, honey. <laughs> I'm married, I know, I got it. So here's how you roll with it. You go, man, I am so glad you saved me all that money. <laughs> <laughs> right but but in, in the in the reality is you know why we do those things Be, because the commercial says if we buy if we ride if we wear if we have we're in the group right we're accepted and all of us want to be accepted and in a spiritual sense you know it's even more wacky you get you get folks in church and they think they got to earn their way to heaven and they got to be good. And I, hey, I'm all for good, right? I get paid to be good. You get, you're good for nothing. <laughs> you're like, I'm going to follow that guy. I don't think that's true. <laughs> but we think we could work our way to heaven. You got a holy God. How many of you had a bad thought today? <laughs> yeah, as so, soon as I walked down on stage, you thought, oh, he's here. <laughs> I thought we had a guest speaker today, <laughs> right? You missed the mark. You, you can't earn your way to, to God. We try, don't we? We have a lot of friends who try that too. And here's what's interesting. And it, this is liberating if you can grab a hold of it. You are accepted to God, not because of what you do. And listen, Pastor Dan wants you to do good things. There's no doubt about that. But you're accepted to God because of what Christ has done on your behalf. And when you get your mind around that, and you understand the sacrifice that Christ made for you, it will compel you to live a life that will honor and glorify him. Won't it? Yes. When you recognize that, 
It will compel you. Not, not that we can just go out and sin so, you know, hey, let's just, you know, eat, drink, and be merry. Who cares? We have a relationship with Christ. It will compel you to live a life that will, is worthy of him. And so we are accepted to God through Christ, not because of what we've done. <clears throat> Here is a cool truth to hold on to, number two. God does not change you in order that he may love you. God loves you in order that he may change you. Right? And you, you have unbelieving friends. Folks, listen. Unbelievers act like unbelievers. And they will never act like a believer until they invite Jesus into their life and they have the power of the Holy Spirit to change their life. Otherwise, they will just simply live on their own power. And so as a church, as followers of Christ, we've got to recognize sinful people do sinful things. Right? That's their nature. They've, they've not had a new nature placed in them. <clears throat> Look at in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. It says, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still, what were we? Sinners. Sinners. Christ died for us. Now here's, I want you to grab a hold of this because, you know, I have to times hear people say, oh, God loves everyone, right? Yes, God loves everyone, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But we are only acceptable to him through Christ. There is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. God loves all of humanity, but it is only through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ are we acceptable to him. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right? And so you'll hear people say, we're all God's children. We aren't. We are all God's creation. We are not children of his until we are adopted into the family through Jesus Christ. Are we tracking? All right, so, so we get into this, hey, ollie, ollie, auction free, everyone's in. Not so, not so. And again, either Jesus is a liar or he's saying the truth. Either he says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me or he's a nut job. But he's not in between, right? He's not in between. And the key in your outline, the key to all of everything we went over in this whole series is the little phrase, in Christ. In Christ, you are righteous. In Christ, you are a saint. In Christ, all the resources of heaven belong to you. In Christ, you are acceptable to a holy God. Because that is your position that you have. You are in him. If you strike the word in, you're not. You no longer are righteous. You no longer a saint, you no longer have the resources, and you no longer are acceptable to God. It's only in him are we accepted. So here we go, we're going to wrap up. We're going to play a little game. You ready? Turn to your neighbor, let's play patty cakes. Here we go. If we brought a 55-gallon drum up here, and we selected one of you to go into the drum... And we place them, now I know some of you already have thoughts of who that might be. And we placed that person in and we sealed it up and we all took a field trip down to the river, right? We went to the dock and we threw the 55-gallon drum with you in it into the river. Let's play a game. Let's see if we can get it. The first group wasn't that good. So here we go, all right? You guys look a lot smarter than the other group. Well, at least this half does. Anyway, all right, that half there is a little bit. So if you're in a barrel in the river, where would you be? You would be in a barrel in a river, right? Okay, and then after, we'll show you guys where you guys are parked, okay? We'll, we'll, we'll walk you to your car, okay? So don't get confused, all right? All right, so you would be in a barrel in the river, right? Okay, now... Where are you right now? Where you're no longer in a river in a barrel. Where are you right now? Where are you at right now? You're in Oakley and you're in a building that houses Laurel Ridge Community Church. Tracking? Are we doing okay? All right. 
All right, now, in a spiritual sense, not in a literal sense, where are you? In Christ. Good, you guys are good. And where's Christ right now? No, nope. the Holy Spirit is in you. Where's Christ right now? In the heavenly realms. In a spiritual sense. In a spiritual sense, not in a literal sense. You are in Christ, and you, in a spiritual sense, are in the heavenly realms. Therefore, you have the resources, right? That's what verse 4 says. You have all the resources in the heavenly realms because of Christ, right? Now, that is a huge thought, and we could all sit around a table and discuss this for months on end, the, the implications of what that means. But here's what Paul wants us to grab a hold of. When we understand the doctrine of who we are in Christ, and we understand our position not only in Christ, but in a spiritual sense, in the heavenly realms. When we understand the doctrine, it will translate into our practical living and our daily life. The reason why we don't live that way is because we're like the elephant. We have a perception or a stronghold that we wrestle with. And either what God says to you and about you is true or what you believe about yourself is true. And as we sit here today, you are in Christ. You are a saint. You are righteous. You have the resources of, of Christ. And I don't know if you figured out what that is, but it's pretty stinking powerful, right? And you are acceptable to a holy God through him. And if folks, if you can get your mind and your heart around that, it will set you free on how you live because doctrine is going to drive how we live our life. And if you can get it, boy, I tell you, it is absolutely powerful to recognize who you are and your position in Christ. And so here we go. See if you figured it out. Otherwise, we're going to go till two. How many of you need patience in your life? How many of you need more love in your life to love people knuckleheads like me? How many saints do I have in the house today? Let's pray.